done with chapter 10 today. Um, there's no homework due next week. I decided not to like make the first Saturday of spring break uh, a day for homework to be due, especially since we have the um, chapter test coming up and homework. Chapter 11 is not due next Wednesday, but the Wednesday after spring break, if that makes any sense. Um, I can make the chapter 10 homework do the Saturday like it is right now, or I can push it back to, I don't know, midweek next week. Like, I mean, students always like having more time on the homework, but I don't want to screw you up with things. Yeah? Pedro's like, please, Mr. Pedro. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, uh, next Wednesday, okay? Okay. Why don't, why don't we do that? Um, when I forget, remind me tomorrow. I'm in teaching mode right now. I'm not in remember to change uh, change due date mode. All right, pork. <clears throat> so so far, what have we done? We've done kinematics in circles, and we've done energy in circles. Not not necessarily conservation of energy, sort of full blown problems, but like we introduced this idea. And really, the excuse for introducing you to energy was to teach you that there's now rotational kinetic energy. And possibly more importantly, this concept and idea of the moment of inertia, this idea that mass in rotation matters. So now, with all of that in place, we can drop the, the atomic bomb on you of torque. And why is this such a big deal? This is Newton's second law in rotational terms. Yay. <laughs> so, when Newton's second law comes up, what does that mean? <laughs> Change my major. Free body diagrams, force, do I need to put the hat on? Yeah. Vectors, yeah. the whole nine yards, right? Okay, it, it's just, it's just, yeah, it's going to be fun. So, hang on for the ride, we're going to have some really nasty math today, okay? So, Let's, um, I never, after 22 years, I'm never quite sure how to really kind of go about this. Let's, let's start a little bit of math and then we'll break it up with some concept and go back to, to a lot of math. Okay. So, um, Newton's second law. You know me, I kind of like to write it what the rest of the world would consider to be in reverse, right? Okay. Is this idea, right, that the net force, right, this sum of all the forces, the vector sum of all the forces acting on an object. If you have a net force, you must have an acceleration. There's simply no question. But it's always in a straight line, right? The net force is always pointing somewhere, and that's the direction the acceleration is happening. The amount of acceleration depends on the mass. In exactly the same conceptual framework, Newton's second law in rotational terms, instead of mass, is going to employ this new moment of inertia that I've taught you about. Okay? Instead of A, it's going to be alpha, good job. Okay? And instead of forces, it's going to be the sum of torques. That is the Greek letter tau. Uh, it looks a lot like a lowercase t, but you don't, don't go above the crossbar with it, okay? Um, technically, I think in print it's supposed to have like kind of a, a squiggly top or something like that, okay? Uh, but usually we just go like that, okay? And if I'm going really fast, it starts to look like a t anyway, okay? So contextualize it. But yeah, that's the Greek letter tau. <clears throat> Didn't know. I'll just spell t-a-u. Um, now, what is a torque? I'm going to give you a definition that's a Mr. Balin definition. 
And I've been told over the years that my definition makes the most sense, and that's no surprise, I'm teaching it, right? So I'll write down the ones that the book says and all these kinds of things, but we really, there, there's an idea here that's really, really important that a lot of equations imply, and if you're not realizing what's going on, you'll miss out on it, and it's this. A torque, okay, any torque, is a, a distance okay, uh, that is perpendicular to some force. I'm going to write this sort of symbol a lot. This is not a Mr. Bayless symbol. This is an actual physics symbol that we use. That, what looks like an upside down T subscript is the perpendicular symbol. So in mathematics, we'll use this symbol to indicate something is perpendicular, and we'll use that symbol to indicate something is parallel. Okay? So sometimes it'll be like, well, if the force is parallel to something, right? This isn't a 1, 1, it's a parallel symbol, okay? Or if the force is perpendicular to something, okay? So you don't really see that notation in a physics 4 textbook, uh, but I'm going to employ it here. The key idea here is that we are always looking for a force and a distance that are at 90 degrees to each other. What do I mean by all of this and what, is, what, what happens with torque? I need a volunteer, somebody who feels like they're capable right now of opening a door. Jonathan, you've already volunteered, but I appreciate it. Thank you. Get more people up there. Somebody who's willing to come and help me open a door. Ah, oh, thank you. Come on up. Thank you. All right. Uh, let, me, let me check, make sure I have not. OK, I did. Good job. Don't want that to be the trick, okay? So, Ian, right? Ian, would you please uh, open that door? I want everybody to watch what he does. <gasps> did you see it? Okay, Ian, why did you grab that part of the door? Because. Uh, because why? Because he has to twist his Oh, oh, okay, there's a handle here. Good job, okay, all right. Good, now, what I want you to do is come on this side of the door. Okay. okay. And, uh, let's see, with one finger, don't hurt yourself, with one finger, I want you to hold this door open. Okay, interesting. Where, where did he put his finger in relation to the axis of rotation of the door? As far out as possible, right? You know why you did that? Because it's easier, right? Okay. Okay, oh, okay, good. So, like, will you do it maybe more towards the middle? Okay, are you ready? Again, don't hurt yourself. So you can hold it open there, right? But is it easier or harder? It's definitely, it's definitely harder. OK, now try it over here. Ooh, strong finger. Strong finger. Give him a hand, everybody. It's fantastic. OK. So again, notice, right, it was, it was harder the closer you got to the yeah. axis of rotation. OK, and it was easier on the outside. We would say that there's more torque. Okay. Less force required because the distance was longer. Okay, so let's do this now. Okay, I want you. Let's see. Go ahead and spin the wheel by like make it go that way. Ooh, ooh, ooh! Did everybody see what he did? Okay, do this too fast. Do it again. Don't do. You have to go slow. But. Oh, ooh, ooh! What? Which way did Ian pull on the tire? It was down, right? Can you do it from the top? Make it spin the same direction, but around the top. Oh, okay. Well, he went all the way around. Just, just, just one, one pull. You can use your hand. You have to use your finger. Oh, oh, ooh, okay. All right. Which direction is he in pulling to get this thing to rotate? Perpendicular to the tire, right? Okay. To get it to rotate, he pulled down, right? Okay. We're spin it up. Make it go up. Oh, ah, right, did you see it? It was a perpendicular force that caused the rotation. We have a center, we have a distance where the force was applied. A torque happened, and I can tell the torque happened because there was angular acceleration. Okay, Ian, anyway, I want you to do this time. Go ahead and just like plant your palm on there, right? Okay. Um, I want you to push directly towards the center of the wheel. Does that make sense? Okay, I just, you can use both hands, you can use both hands, okay, okay, I just want you to push directly toward, the point toward the center. all right, everybody give him a hand. Okay, 
Um, why wouldn't the tire spin, even though there was a lot of force being applied directly towards the center? It was parallel, wasn't it? And in order for a torque to happen, what do you need? You need a perpendicular component of force. Now, it can be a perpendicular component of force, or it can be a perpendicular component of distance. We'll get into that in chapter 12, OK? But crucially, right, doors are designed with the handle as far out from the axis of rotation as possible. The lever arm, the R in that equation right there, okay, is always the distance from the axis of rotation out to the point where the force is applied. And when we go up to the door, we open it, right? We apply that force perpendicular to the distance, right? There's like a, there's like a distance vector here, okay? And then there's a force that causes it to open, right? And so this brings up several questions in my brain, okay? First of all, why do they put doorknobs here? Or they're here. Or here. Why out here? That point meets the least force. Okay. Least force. So can I can I apply the same torque? Okay? here, in the middle of the door, as I do out here? Uh, you can. I can, but what, what happens? If I've got half the distance, what do I have to do to the force? I have to double the force to get the same torque, right? If it's the same amount of force, a little tiny bit of force here isn't enough right here, okay? So they put the door handles and the door knobs as far away from the hinge as possible to minimize the amount of force that's required to open the door. And because all the mechanism is right here, right? Okay? If you put the doorknob in the middle of the door, right, you'd have to have like a bolt that's half the length of the door. That just wastes the materials. This also shows you that hobbits are dumb. Because in just about every Lord of the Rings, anything that's ever been depicted, hobbit door, okay, hobbits are done for two reasons. Number one, they make their doors round. It's cool. I, I get it, it's cool. And I get it's a hobbit hole and all that kind of stuff. And I don't wanna, I don't wanna be down on a culture's choice of geometry, okay? <laughs> But round things are actually fairly hard to make out of square things. In other words, it's wooden planks that have to be fashioned into a round shape, okay? Which takes extra time. You could just make a rectangular door. Second, the doorknobs are always pictured in the middle of the door. I mean, geometrically pleasing, right? Okay? If you watch very closely in the Peter Jackson version of The Lord of the Rings, okay, all of the exterior doors, all of the shots that are shot from outside looking at the front door of the hot wolf have the doorknob in the middle. When it switches to the interior set, where the door was actually functional, all the knobs are over here. <laughs> Oopsie. Okay. I, I'm a nerd. I look for stuff like that. Anyway. Hobbits are awesome for all the other reasons, though, right? Like breakfast, the second breakfast, and elevensies, lunch. Anyway, if I if I push on this door directly towards its hinge, why is there no angular change of motion? The parallel force gives rise to. Zero torque. Is there a lot of force? Okay. Yeah, be careful how you answer. It's just me pushing. No matter how much force you apply, right? If you apply it parallel to the distance, right, from the axis of rotation, you're not going to get any torque. So force is like force. Force is a straight up push or a pull, right? But a torque 
we've got a couple of things going on here. It's, it's the relationship in marriage between the amount of force and the amount of distance that we have. And so we've got to be careful about how we think about it, use it, etc., etc. So this equation is the black equation, just written in angular terms. But the one I've just boxed just now, kind of the Mr. Bailo method of thinking about it. Your book and, all, and the internet and everybody, they're going to come in and they're going to tell you something like this. They're going to say that the torque... Okay, magnitude of torque, not direction, is equal to R times F times the sine of theta. Now, that's true. I'm not going to say that that's wrong. It's not wrong. It's correct. But it's a trap. It's a trap. We try to explain a little bit. And this is, this is a bit of a spoiler for chapter 11 and 12. Okay? Let's, let's take a look. This is like a, like a top-down view of the door, right? Like seen from above, okay? Drone's eye view of the door. We've got the, the hinge over here on the left-hand side, okay? And we come along and we apply a force, right? Okay? That force is applied and there's a distance, okay, right here. Those are actually both vectors, okay? Um, I'm going to... I should be more careful. I'm actually going to take the vector signs and just call that a magnitude right there. Uh, sorry about that. The, those two vectors, the R vector and the F vector, combine to produce a new vector called the torque. Those of you that have taken math by B, is it 6? Where do you first learn about how to multiply vectors? Math 6. Okay, so those who take it are in math six. We've already learned one way to multiply vectors, right? Dot product. Dot product. There's another way. Cross product. Cross, cross product. So the torque is actually the cross product, okay, between two vectors. So again, just 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 kind of showing you where we're where we're gonna go, okay, with this, right? Okay, this is gonna end up being cross product. We'll handle that a little bit later. Okay, we've got a, we got training wheels on for chapter ten. So. When you do the cross product, one of the features of the cross product is that you can find its magnitude by taking magnitude first vector, magnitude second vector, and then sine of the angle between the two vectors. And that's where we run into a problem. It's this angle between vectors that can be very tricky. Okay? So I say it's a trap. They're leaning on the math, which is just fine. The math is correct. But they're ignoring a skill that we have worked very hard to develop throughout the entire course. Let me see if I can't explain what I mean. What happens if the force is like that? What if it's not nice and perpendicular? What if somebody comes up to the door and tries to open it, right, instead of perpendicular, right, tries to come in here and pulls this way? Now, I'm pulling pretty hard, right, but there's not a whole lot of torque. Why is there not a whole lot of torque? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm kind of doing it at almost like a 20, 30 degree angle here, right, okay? So, what can you tell me about the component of force that is perpendicular to the door? I'm down here at like a 20 degree angle. Most of the force is parallel with the door, isn't it? Par Anti-parallel with the direction. Arms going up this way, my hands mostly going that way. But if I, I'll latch it first, okay? If I pull uh, really hard, I do get just a little bit of component of force, right? And we've spent, since chapter five, right, learning how to do components of forces. And for whatever reason, physics textbooks decide in chapter 10 to say, ah, you know what, we're gonna forget all of that skill, and we're just gonna tell you RF sine theta, good luck. Because finding the angle between vectors is not as easy as it sounds. So, that's why I think in terms of R perpendicular to F. 
if we need to find the torque between R and the blue F, and we say, we know, let's say that this angle is at 20 degrees. Which component of this force are you going to use? You're going to go, okay, well, there's a piece that goes up like this, a piece that goes, and you would end up using F sine theta, right? You're like, well, Mr. Beta, what's the big deal? I got, we got sine anyway. What happens? We give you a force like this and tell you the angle right here is 30 degrees. Now, which component do you need to use to find the torque? Sine of 60. Right? Okay. Just going back. You can't make me. And that's fine. You can do that, right? That, that's, that's cool. I, I will not mark that down because it's, it's still correct, right? but it's the F cosine 30 degree angle right there that is the perpendicular component to the distance R. So please, I don't want you walking out of my class believing the only way to find torque is with sine. That is, that is not true. Okay? Fall back on that skill that you paid blood, sweat, and tears to learn in finding components of vectors. Just find the perpendicular component. It's fast. You know touching, not touching, it goes that fast. You don't have, it's not a guess. Because if you just RF sine theta, it, it might be a guess. You're guessing at what the angle is between vectors. Right? So I, I, I'm, I'm trying to prepare you, all of those of you that have to take statics. Because in statics, you can do this over and over and over again. Yes, torques cause angular accelerations. Just like forces cause things to change their motion, cause them to accelerate, a torque causes them to rotate, to change their rotation. So do you apply a torque to the tires and wheels of your car when you push on the gas pedal? Yes, yes the engine, everything applies a torque to the axle, right, to get the tire to go. It's causing a change in rotation. Your tire wasn't rotating, and now it is rotating. Same thing when you slam on the brakes. There's torques in there, right? Torque every time you open a door. Torque every time anything spins. And how many spinny objects are there? All, all of them, <laughs> like, right? Like, it, 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 the exception is when something is moving in a straight line, because most of the time things rotate or curve or don't take a linear path. All right, just to uh, continue the melting of your brain. When you have a force, say, that's like the blue one over here, okay? You don't have to find the components of force. I know it's the one that's easy in your brain, and I'm bringing this up now because I'm going to bring it up again in Chapter 12, okay? And um, it's, it's, it's going to melt your brain then too, but at least it'll be the second time. The distance and the force have to be perpendicular to each other. So either you find the perpendicular component of the force or you find the perpendicular component of the distance. Every force has something called a line of action. It's a, just an imaginary line that's drawn through the force. And, I did this too low, if you draw a distance that is perpendicular to the line of action of the force, then you can also find the torque. So for example, we knew that angle right there, we would use sine, R sine theta times F. We wouldn't have to find the perpendicular. And I know you're looking at that, it's kind of the first time you've seen it or heard about it or something like that. And I was like, well, why would anybody ever do that? Well, when we get to chapter 12, I'll show you. Okay, so just, just slide that one sort of into your back pocket, safe to ignore for now, but your brain has seen it once and I'll, I'll refer back to it again. All right, let's do, let's do an example. Okay. 
So we're going to do the potter's wheel. I'm just taking the hat off because it's hot, not because the vectors are gone. Okay. So in pottery, right, uh, throwing a, a, a bowl or cup or any kind of work on the potter's wheel, um, you put the clay down and spin it up, right? So what we're going to do is we are going to slow down a potter's wheel that is already running. And what we want to find, right, is how much friction. What's the coefficient of friction between that rag, okay, and the, the, the potter's wheel? Potter's wheels are pretty heavy. Pretty large objects could take quite a bit of force and kinetic friction, right, to get this thing to stop. So we're looking for friction, and we're looking for a coefficient of friction. What do we, like, kind of automatically know? Let's fall back to Chapter 6. What do we sort of automatically know when coefficients are involved? The little mu. Fun. We know we're in for a fun time. And with fun, there's going to be a normal force, there's going to be a frictional force. We're going to have to contextualize those forces in some sort of free body diagram to be able to organize our thoughts. And so you, you start with this big picture, right? Okay, they're asking for a coefficient of friction. That means forces. It's sometimes possible to find it through energy. We can do like work energy, and sometimes that friction ends up in work other. And that would definitely be where I would go first. The problem with this problem, anybody see it? The thing that kills energy. Time. Right? Time. Time is a dead giveaway that we're probably doing kinematics, right? If we're doing kinematics, that means we're probably going to find an acceleration. We're going to find an acceleration. We're going to have to use the second law. So this one got dark real fast. Start with a free body diagram. We're going to draw a free body diagram of the potter's wheel. That's sort of the, the, the thing that this problem is all about. So I am going to cheat with my circle tool. I'm so happy with the circle tool. Like, I used to just practice, right, trying to get that. That, that perfect circle with your arm, and I could never do it. So now I can do it. All right. So this is like, a, again, top-down view of the potter's wheel, right? And we've got we've to gotta think simultaneously in straight lines and in circles. Let's, let's start with the circles, okay? I'm going to say, and I get to pick, okay? my coordinate system or what's going on, right? And so I'm just going to choose. They don't, they don't really tell me. I don't think it's all that important. I'm going to choose that the angular velocity, the direction that this potter's wheel is spinning as seen from above, is going to be counterclockwise. And so I've, I've indicated that I'm just sort of setting up the problem so it's rotating that direction. And that, this will just help me to figure out all the other things that are going on, right? So let's say it's spinning counterclockwise, right? Now, it says that they press a wet rag against the rim. And I'm thinking like they come in sort of horizontally from the side, okay? And push in like from the side of the wheel. Not, not like vertically down on top of it, but into the side. And again, the problem doesn't give me a picture or anything, and so I, I'm, I'm a bit free. I can apply that that rag really anywhere along the edge of that circle. And so I'm just going to pick the right-hand side. Again, it sort of just feels, I don't know, lying it along like an x-axis just feels nice, right? Okay. But uh, really, could I have done it like right here? It would have been, would have been identical, OK? All right. So I'm just, I'm making some, uh, to get traction in this, I have to make some assumptions. Now, my assumptions could end up being wrong. But I'll have to go back and correct later. Don't be afraid of wrong assumptions, right? It's like the prototyping process. Just start doing stuff, see what goes wrong, and then fix it. Okay. So I've got, it's pushing in. Interesting. Okay. We know that there needs to be a frictional force in here somewhere, right? And that force F that I've drawn in there. Do we know anything about that force? 
It's 70 newtons. That's my 70 newton force. Is it a normal force? Is that force being applied perpendicular to the surface where it contacts the potter's wheel? Yeah, right? And so it's the normal force. I called it F, but it's the, am I gonna draw an additional normal force on there? No. What's the object that's causing this force? It's the rag. Are there any other objects pushing or pulling on the potter's wheel? No. So my 70 Newton force that I call that is the normal. Normal because it's perpendicular. Okay. We know normal force and friction are involved, so there's going to be a kinetic friction here. What direction will the kinetic friction be pointing at that surface of contact to slow down this wheel? Down. It has to be down. And you just naturally figured out the torque that was required. You're like, no, I didn't, Mr. Bale. I was not thinking about that. I was thinking about YouTube or Instagram or something else. Anything other than this class. We need to slow the disc down. Which way is the disc spinning? Counterclockwise. Which means the acceleration has to be clockwise. And in order for that to happen, there must be some force acting at some distance r that would cause an alpha an acceleration in the clockwise direction. One trick that I'm going to teach you over and over again is that when you're trying to figure out the direction of a torque, okay, take your pencil, grab one end of your pencil, doesn't matter which end, grab one end of your pencil, that's your axis of rotation. So here the axis of rotation is right at the center of the wheel. Then Push or pull on your pencil in the direction of the force, in this case, straight down. The direction that your pencil rotates is the direction of the torque. What's the direction of the torque here that's caused by that friction? We would say clockwise. It's rotating clockwise, right? Now try it with the 70 Newton force. Be careful if you're pushing on the pointy end of your pencil. Is this causing any kind of rotation? No. So does the 70 Newton force cause any torque? No. It's only the friction that exists perpendicular to the distance from the center of the wheel. And you can use your pencil as a, as a direct physical thing to figure out the directions of torques. Again, you don't want to be sitting there guessing. <laughs> okay? If you're sitting there guessing, you're doing it wrong. Have something that you can rely on in order to make decisions. So that would be like having to pull out, right? We're, we're pushing the rag onto the surface, but maybe they're, I don't know, tugging outwards on the thing or whatever, right? Okay. Well, are you asking the context of this thing? Well, you would just pull on it. It's not causing this to rotate, right? In order for a torque to happen, you have to have a perpendicular That, this one, we're using the, I think that is unique to me, okay? And I'm not going to take credit for its discovery. About um, five years ago, I had a hearing impaired student in, uh, in all three of my physics four series classes, 4A, 4B, 4C, um, and uh, they needed a translator, a sign language interpreter to be in class all the time. Um, translating uh, sign language is very hard. Like, it's a language that's not necessarily built up of words, built up of ideas and concepts, okay? And the interpreters that we had were amazing. They were prototyping and pioneering a new kind of a subset of American Sign Language that was specifically meant for STEM, for STEM topics. And they, they had an entire sign language on how to deal with vectors, okay? And I remember, I still remember the day I was standing right here. And I always had the sign language interpreters right with me, right? Because they were 
in every essence, the teacher for that person, and we were a partnership, right? So they were standing next to me, and I was talking about torque and doing the wheel and all that kind of stuff. And I caught out of the corner of my eye the sign language interpreter, and I'm not going to be able to do it right, but they were taking their hand, okay, and they were kind of holding it like this, and then they were like pushing, okay, and going like this to sign the various directions that torque was happening. And I just stopped class and I said, what are you doing? And the poor sign language interpreter thought they had done something wrong, right? Okay. Like, no, 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 that looks awesome. Will you please teach us what you're doing? And so they stopped and started teaching the class that in this subset of American Sign Language, they can indicate torque by taking the distance and then applying the force, right? And not only is this the symbol for torque, they can give you the direction of any torque, right? And I went, oh my gosh, we're all learning this now, <laughs> right? And so that entire class started signing to each other, right? All the different torques. And so I went and took it kind of further to do the actual physical lever arm, right? And then applying that force up and down. When we, when we make things accessible for everybody, okay, we learn some amazing stuff. It's, it's just really, really cool. Anyway, um, where was I? Oh, fun! So, we know there's a torque here. Now we've got sort of a free body diagram. It's not a free body diagram until we do one extra thing. Remember? Axes. Coordinate system, right? So this is a rotational coordinate system. And so that means we simply have to choose the direction we want to call positive. And that direction is either going to be clockwise or counterclockwise. And in chapters five and six, I gave you a rule of thumb to stay safe about your directions. What direction do you always want to choose to be positive? Same direction as the acceleration. What direction is the acceleration? Clockwise or counterclockwise? Counterclockwise. Clockwise. <laughs> you just told me about five minutes ago that the force had to be down clockwise, right, in order for this thing to slow down. So it's spinning counterclockwise but it's slowing down. So that means that the angular acceleration has to be in the clockwise direction. And so I'm just going to, what I do to specify my coordinate system for rotation is I draw an arrow that's in a circle, almost a circle, okay? And it's either, it's either going in a clockwise direction or a counterclockwise direction. This is the symbol that I use to indicate what direction I'm calling positive rotation. Okay. All right. We're set and ready to go. The light is dimming before my eyes. Did the lights did dim, right? Yeah. That wasn't just me. It happens all the time. It happened this morning when I got up because I opened my eyes and I was still asleep. All right. We're going to start here because we always start at Newton's second law. Right? It's the rule. And it's, it's I alpha equals torques instead of MA equals F. But we're going to turn the same sort of crank. Okay? We need to answer how many torques are there in the problem and how many, right, and all that kind of stuff, just like we did with forces. So... I alpha equals, drop the vector signs, because we're just going to do it. There's one dimension to torque. Two directions, one dimension. Unlike x and y being perpendicular to each other, torque just only, it's one dimension. It's either clockwise or counterclockwise. That's it. Okay. So I alpha equals, now we kind of a three-step process here. This is kind of new for torques. Three-step process. Number one, how many torques are there? There's one. Okay. Write down what that torque is in this just symbolically. It's a torque due to the friction. Torque sub F, tau sub F. Now, go and put a sign on it, positive or negative torque. It's a positive torque. And then, only then, after you've established the direction, then write down what the torque is. Remember, torque is distance and force being perpendicular to each other. What's the distance to, to F, to the, to the friction? It's R. 
So I alpha is going to equal R. And what is the perpendicular force to that distance? It's the friction. Do I have to go find a component? No. It's already, it's acting on the tangential to the surface of the circle. So I don't have to go find any components anywhere. Okay? So, now that I've got that written down, I've got to figure out now what the problem is asking me, right? Okay? They want coefficient of friction. Coefficient of friction is hiding in there, right? Because of fun, right? So I alpha is going to be equal to R times mu times... Run! Run! Everybody run. Okay. We know what the normal force is. What is it? 70. We know what R is. What is it? 0.5. Okay. Always make sure it's a radius, not a diameter. Um, do we know... We're looking for mu... So mu is going to be equal to I alpha over R times N. So we know R, we know N. Do we know the moment of inertia? The problem? Oh, the chart? We have to employ the chart? Why am I so excited about employing the chart? Because I don't have to do any integrals. Right? The chart is saving us from integration. So, which of these looks like a potter's wheel? Hint, it's not B. Probably F, right? Okay? The, notice there's no indication that the thickness matters. That just adds mass, right? Okay? But we've got a disk spinning on an axis with radius R, so we know that the moment of inertia has to be 1 half total mass times radius squared. So I know that my it's going to be one half m r squared, and we know both the mass and that radius, right? So I can go ahead and mu equals uh, m r squared alpha over two r n. Okay. Um, last thing I do. Oh, I can get rid of one of these r's, right? Well, that's nice m r alpha over 2n, okay? And then the last thing that I don't know is what? Well, we don't have alpha, do we? Alpha's not given in the problem, but do they give us enough stuff to find alpha? Unfortunately, yeah. We've got a time, we have an initial speed, we know what the final speed is. What's the final speed? Zero. Zero comes to a stop. What do we do? What we did on Monday. Wait a second, Mr. Bailo. Are you telling me that there could be problems that have both kinematics and Newton's second law in them? The smile says it all, doesn't it? So, let's see. Um, I'm just going to guess first equation because I'm tired and I don't want to think about it. Did it work? Do I know all those things? Yeah, yeah actually, I want alpha, so it's going to be that, right? Uh, we do need to get the revolutions per minute into um, uh, radians per second, okay? Um, so let's see here. I did that. The, this 50 revolutions per minute is equal to 5.24 radian, radians per second. Um, the alpha that you get when you calculate all this is equal to... Now, you'll probably get a negative sign, right? Because the, it stops at zero, but it starts, right? So it's final minus initial. Um, don't don't insert that negative into our equation down there. Why are we not inserting that? So it's negative for the kinematics, right? Because it came to a stop. But why is it not negative when we put it into our equation down there? We set the direction to be the same direction as the acceleration for the Newton second law problem, right? We just need the magnitude of the acceleration. All right. So this is going to be, what's the mass? 100 times 0.5 times 0.873 all over 2 times 70. 
and that's going to get me 0.312. And what are the units on a coefficient of friction? Nothing, no units. It's a lot, isn't it? That's a lot. And for those of you who came in late, when's homework due? Monday. Tonight? Yeah. Next Wednesday. Today's Wednesday, right? Next Wednesday. Instead of this Saturday, pushing next Wednesday. But your only grasp for it is this Friday, right? That in mind. All right. Since we are um, in the mode, so to speak, and uh, your brain is completely scrambled egg at this point, let, let's just let's just throw you off the cliff. Okay. But let's let's just let's just go full 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 board here. Okay. Now you you've seen. You've seen this before. What was it? Was it did we have an art mark? Snark mark, wasn't it? Okay. Sliding down hills, things like that. Uh, we did uh, connected objects, right? Two different masses over the pulley. Until now. What has that pulley been like? Frictionless. Frictionless. Massless. 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 Why have we been doing that? When you give a pulley no mass, or negligible mass, small enough so that you don't have to worry about it, right? What is its moment of inertia? If its mass is zero, it's also zero. And so therefore, the pulley cannot apply a torque, right? When we give the pulley mass, now what happens? Doom! Doom and destruction! No, we can do this. We can do this. Didn't you say it was supposed to be easy after the second assault? No, I never said that. People keep saying I said that. I said that the second and third exams are the hardest ones in the course. <laughs> you said it goes up and it starts to come It's st Okay. It's still going up. <laughs> <laughs> Newton's second law, the first time you see it, is rough. This is the second time you're seeing it. I know, there's a lot of stuff coming together, but you've got this. This is your second time through it. And so students report to me that for that, that second exam is like peak, but, but Everest has two peaks, okay? The main peak, and then there's a little saddle, and there's a slightly lower peak, right? Halfway up Everest, you're like, oh, I think it's leveling out all. <laughs> Welcome to Physics 4A. Now, the fourth exam is to dip back down to base. Yeah. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. And it's it's it shifts over the years. It's kind of funny. That didn't used to be the case when I first started teaching. Students always complained that the first exam was the hardest, and the and the others were okay. So I don't know. I'm not responsible for what you learn in high school. So, all right, let's do this. Um, we can do mass one and mass two. We've done those before. We gotta draw free body. We gotta draw three free body diagrams. Why three? Mass one, mass two, and now pulley. Right. So I'm gonna go fast for mass one and mass two because they are well. We've done them before. Okay. So we got normal force. We have m one g. We've got t o oh dear one. Before, we always just put T, right? Because the tensions were going to be what? Equal. They were only equal because the pulley had no mass. Now the tensions are different. Um, in my example, yeah, let's throw friction in. Why not? Mass 1 is sliding up the slope, and so the kinetic friction is down the slope. Okay. And uh, let's see, we got M2G. Uh, we do need to find some components. So M1G cosine theta, M1G sine theta. Again, I'm hoping that this looks familiar. You've seen this before, done a lot of it on the homework, refreshing, 
A lot of this chapter 10 is a refreshing of stuff we've done before. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna make, uh, say, I'm just gonna assume that the acceleration is up the slope. Maybe it's slowing down, maybe not, I don't know. I'll get a negative sign if I pick that direction wrong. Which means positive x will be up the slope, positive y away, and what direction will I make positive for mass two to keep things consistent? Take that one down, plus y. So I come over here and I apply Newton's second law in its linear form. I'm not, this is, this is nothing new right now, right? X and Y for mass one, M1, A equals, uh, what have I got here? I've got T1 minus F minus M1G sine theta in the Y direction, zero equals N minus M1G cosine theta. And then for mass two, it's gonna be M, uh, it's gonna be zero equals zero because nothing going on in the X direction. M2A equals M2G minus T2. Uh, you can go back in your notes for chapter 6, okay, and see all of that. Yeah? For the mass 1, why did you use angular acceleration and not the normal one? I did? What? Where? You put alpha plus an A. Oh, uh, it looks, okay, yeah, it's an A. My alphas look like that. My A's look like that. So I'll, I'll, I'll that is fair. My handwriting is terrible. Everybody said I should have been a doctor. What they didn't know, okay, is that I can't memorize anything. So. All right. Nothing new there. Went really fast, okay? Because again, we've done this before. What's the new thing? It's the pulley. Okay. And so instead of drawing anything on that small pulley up there, what I've done is I've taken this pulley right here and magnified it down here, right? Okay. So it's like a zoomed in on the pulley for the, the shape down here, right? Okay. So we've got our pulley and we've got these two string, these ropes, right? Physics string applying tension. We know tension one is pulling mass one up the slope. So by Newton's third law, what direction does tension one act on the pulley? Down the slope, because Newton's third law tells us the forces are equal, but opposite in direction. So if mass two is being tugged up the slope by tension one, that means tension one is acting that direction on the pulley. Now, by a similar argument, what direction would T2 be pulling on this pulley? T2 is pulling up on mass two, so it'd be pulling down. So tension is pulling away from mass one, but pulling away from the Tensions can only ever pull, they cannot push. Okay. By definition. By physical law. I can pull on this string. What happens if I try to push with it? Nothing. Right? All right. This is, again, not guesswork. You apply the rules of the universe, they tell you what to do, right? So if you feel like you're guessing, it just means that you haven't practiced enough, okay? And you want to get to the point where you can say, okay, I'm picking this thing because, and the because better not be because, just, I'm guessing, <laughs> right? I'm picking this thing because, and then physics somewhere, right? Okay? All right, uh, those are the tensions. Are those tar tensions applying torques? Yes. And since it's a roundup pulley and torques are involved, we better do Newton's second law in terms of rotational things. I said that, uh, I'm so sorry. You meant this A, didn't you? Was that the A you meant? Sorry. Okay. So if the acceleration is up the slope and down, what do we need to do in order to be consistent? 
to keep the direction of acceleration consistent for all three objects, we better make the acceleration down here be clockwise. All right. We are going to apply Newton's second law in its rotational form. There is only one direction, one dimension, the, dire the dimension of torque. It has two directions, just like x has two directions, positive and negative, right? Torque has two directions, clockwise and counterclockwise. So I write down, like I did in the green, ma. But instead of writing ma, I write rotational mass, i, and angular acceleration, alpha. And then, three-step process. How many torques, their directions, and then finally, mathematically, what they are. So how many torques are there acting on this pulley? There's two. Torque from T1 and torque from T2. You want to just leave space in front of and behind those things, right? So you come back and fill in the directions. Now, right now with each other, determine the directions of torque 1 and torque 2. Use your pencils and show each other. Go. All right, torque from T1, positive or negative? Negative, torque from T2, positive or negative? Positive, why? Take the pencil, hold it at the center of the circle. T1 is pulling this way, which way is my pencil rotating? Counterclockwise, and what direction did we say was positive? So that's gotta be a negative torque. I hold my pencil again at the center, and then it goes out a distance, and now I take T2, and I push it down, or I pull it down. Which way does my pencil rotate? Clockwise, clockwise and clockwise is positive. No guessing. All right. Now that I've got the torques, and now that I've got the signs, I can come in and write down mathematically what they are. And according to Mr. Balo, every torque is a distance and the force that are perpendicular to each other. Uh, what, how are we doing on these uh, radii and these forces? Are they perpendicular already? Do I have to go find components of anything? Nope. Because by definition, if, some, if the string comes off tangentially from the pulley, tangential is perpendicular to that distance. All right. So I can just come in here and write minus r, that's the distance, radius of the pulley. And what's the force? T1 plus r T2. What have we wrought? What can we find? Let's, let's find the acceleration. Let me check something real quick. Okay. Let's find the acceleration. And when I say find the acceleration, I mean find the acceleration of everything. I want the acceleration of M1, mass 2, and the pulley. Are all those accelerations going to be the same? Yes. And why are they going to be the same? Because they're all connected to each other by physics stream. Physics stream doesn't break or stretch. The not breaking, not stretching means the accelerations of all the objects are the same. Now, 
We can write that acceleration as an A or an alpha. Same, but they're all the same. They're all consistent with each other. So let's solve for A. The acceleration of mass one, mass two, with this pulley in the mix. Okay. <laughs> How many useful equations are there? One, two, three, four. Unknown, so let's say we're given, we know mass 1, mass 2, the coefficient of friction, and the angle, and the mass of the pulley. How many unknowns are there? A, T1, F, N, T2, alpha. Well, we know R. Seven. We know that. I mean, yeah, we can find it, right? Okay. Seven unknowns. Four equations. <laughs> How are we going to do this? Multiply by two. <laughs> Multiply by two. <laughs> Find a minus sign. <laughs> Go become a psychology major. We need more equations. What's missing? Fun. Okay, well that helps a lot, right? That gets F and N sort of out of the picture, doesn't it? Okay. There's the moment of inertia, and if the pulley is like solid or something like that, then we can use one half MR squared because it's like a disc. Hopefully we'd be told something about that pulley in the problem. Okay. Um, and then, so we've got I, we've got F. We do have A and alpha. And there's a way that A and alpha can talk to each other. There's a Google Translate for them. Remember that? So there you go. There's the other three that will unlock this. Yeah, I will. There's the algebra. Okay? <laughs> Solving seven equations for seven unknowns. Right? And then you get that thing. <laughs> okay? And you can plug in the numbers. Now, some people gave me some feedback on the last example. Mr. Bailey, you never taught us the thing that was on the question. Um, and in, in my defense, I did. So, in this problem that we've been doing together, okay, we are solving for the acceleration. But a variation of this problem would be to give you the acceleration and ask you to solve maybe for the moment of inertia. To not tell you the pulley is 1 half mr squared, but actually find the moment of inertia, I. Right? So you'd be solving the last blue box there for I, right? based on the torques. That's perfectly fair game. Just because I solved this one for acceleration doesn't mean it can't be solved for tension one or tension two or the moment of inertia, right? That's, that's just different algebra, right? The setup of the problem would be the same. But what are some variations of this problem that you might want to think about or try? What if the thing was not accelerating up? The, what if it was sliding down the slope? What direction would the coefficient, would the kinetic friction be then? 
of the slope. That would be one change to make, right? Okay. So we're, I'm trying to teach you a method, not a specific problem, not a specific result. I mean, I know I come along for this problem and that's the result, right? But that thing in the box is only for this problem. You need to be able to take it and go, okay, what if I was asked to solve for T2? What would I do? What if I was asked to solve for the moment of inertia? What would I do? The setup for solving for the moment of inertia is exactly the same. It's just a different set of knowns and unknowns. And this is, this is what I've been trying to teach you and what all of physics education is all about, okay, uh, all the way through. It's, it's teaching you a method and not necessarily a specific solution, which is annoying to most engineering majors. Because they just want the solution. They want the this. Tell me how to do it. Don't tell me. Don't don't teach me how to get there. Which is fine. Different brains doing different things. But knowing the why. If you go ask um, Dr. Orphy, she's constantly. I think she's a physicist in disguise. I really do because she comes up and always asks me questions about engineering and they're really physics questions. So I'm just I'm suspicious. Ms. Papa Vasily, who used to work for us, and she had to move down to Los Angeles for family reasons. Um, <laughs> one time we were arguing. We worked, we worked really well, still work really well together. She, um, she was saying something like, we were arguing about engineering and physics and what comes first and blah, blah, blah. And uh, she told me, well, engineering is the gateway drug to physics. I was like, yeah, all right, I'll take that. I, I, I've had several converts over the years. People who come in thinking they want to be engineering majors and then discovering they want to be physics majors instead. What is going on? Why would anybody ever do this? Oh, this is a uh, this is what it looks like when you have to go get your water from a well, say in Africa, or they don't have any, or a fishing reel. Or a roll of toilet paper? Are there engineers who engineer toilet paper and have to figure out how much torque can be applied, say, by a cat to the roll in order to get it to unwind? Instead of a mass hanging down there, it could just be somebody pulling down, right? There are people who whose job it is every day to go into work and engineer toilets. That sounds awesome to me, actually. Flow dynamics, how to make them more efficient and use less water, how to make them culturally sensitive across the world. Like, there's a lot. You laugh, but there's different cultural sensitivities when it comes to using a toilet. The American way is not the only way. So, yeah, it's, it's cool stuff, cool stuff. Yeah, what do you do for work? Um, I engineer toilets. <laughs> Doesn't sound as good as I build rockets or something, right? All right, so let's do this. We got we got ten minutes. Let's do this, okay? Um, we've got to pick got to pick a positive direction for rotation. Which way do you think this thing is going to accelerate or change its motion? Probably as drawn, it looks like it's going to go counterclockwise, doesn't it? Starts at rest and begins to fall. It's going to cause counterclockwise rotation. It started at zero and it's picking it up. So not only is it rotating counterclockwise, it's going to accelerate counterclockwise, which is the important bit, right? All right. Um, we got to find a distance, R, right? And... Um, uh, it's an outer radius big R. They're being really careful here, okay? And then there is a, there's a smaller R. It's like there's like an inner axle or something like that. And it's on that inner axle where there's friction. Now, I drew my little R straight up. I didn't have to draw it straight up. I could have done down, up, left, right, okay? But let's just say at that point, that's where the friction is acting. And it doesn't matter where I draw it on that inner radius. It's all going to be the same torque. I just got to get the direction right for this kinetic friction. We know kinetic friction always acts against the direction of motion. Direction of motion, not the acceleration, the actual omega is 
counterclockwise. So what direction must the torque be in order to, for the kinetic friction to be? It better be clockwise. And how do I get a clockwise torque out of that spot right where this radius hits? What direction does my kinetic friction need to be in order to cause my pencil to go clockwise? It's got to be pointing to the right. That's the new bit, right? Here. Is getting comfortable with finding those torques, okay, and the directions that they have to be. Again, if, if I had done this, if I had drawn R right there, I would have drawn my friction like that. If I had drawn my R down here, I would have drawn my friction like that. All of those frictions have exactly the same, all of those, yeah, forces have exactly the same torque direction. They're all causing clockwise torque. Draw it where it feels natural to you. Okay, uh, out here I do have a tension acting down. Uh, on mass one, I've got a tension acting up, and I've got M1G, right? And uh, what direction should we call the acceleration for mass number one as it accelerates downward? We should make it down. We should keep it consistent, right? That means we're going to have fewer mistakes. So down here, this is just M1A equals M1G minus T. Again, I hope you're just sort of comfortable with that at this point. We've written that down a lot. Go back to the other lectures and see how that happens. The, the new part here is up with the wheel and doing the torques on the wheel. It starts with I alpha equals, just like MA equals, how many torques are acting on the, on the wheel? There's two of them, right? What are they? Tension and the friction torque. What's the direction, positive or negative, for the torque due to tension? Pulls down, causing my pencil to rotate counterclockwise, and I called counterclockwise positive. And the friction, well, opposite, because we already did that one. All right. Um, it, they tell me the reel is a hollow cylinder. What are they trying to? What are they trying to tell me? Probably trying to tell me this, right? Okay. So it's 1 half m r1 squared plus r2 squared. So table comes into play. It's going to be r squared plus r squared. So one's big, one's small. All right. Uh, they want the acceleration of the hanging mass. This, this is what I'm after. So if I'm going to find it, what do I need to find? Tension. Okay. So I need tension. Where am I going to get tension? Where's it hiding? I haven't written it down yet. It's in the torque equation, isn't it? So I've got I alpha equals. And then what is my torque due to my tension? Remember, it's a distance times a perpendicular force. The distance is big R, and what's the force? T. And then what's the distance to the frictional force? Little r times the frictional force. Uh, they told me the frictional force. Okay. Um, okay. I've got A's and I've got alphas, so what am I going to have to do? Google Translate it. And then we should be good to go. I is just a number. Um, so I times A over R equals big R times T minus little r times F. Um, getting this all, let's see, this is I A over R uh, plus R F equals big R T. Um, so I can then divide both sides by R, to get rid of that R, and now that T can go in there, and I can solve for A by dividing by M1. Now that, that's algebra at that point. 
uh, I ended up with RMG minus, um, oh, I just left it as torque due to friction, all divided by I over R plus M times R, where this torque due to this friction is R times F. Don't want to waste your time doing the algebra. The setup is what's important, right? So I'm going to, moment of inertia, I'm going to multiply the moment of inertia by the big R and the little R, is the acceleration being divided by little R and being multiplied to the big R? I, if I understood your correction, question correctly, I don't, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The, that was mathematically the same, I think. Okay. I didn't quite follow everything. Yeah, it's kind of complicated. Yeah, but, but like, if I, if I were actually doing this problem and they gave me numbers, I would probably just get what the moment of inertia is as a number. Right? We know m, we know big R, we know little r. So it's going to be whatever it is, 7.6, whatever. Right? Okay? And then that would just carry through, right? At some point, I'd divide it by big R. I'm not sure. Did I answer your question? Yeah. How much it fights changing its rotation. How hard it is to get it to change its rotation. Speed it up, slow it down. How big is chapter 10? Huge, right? Chapter 11 next week is going to be on momentum and cross products and actually finding like big torques and doing a little bit more with energy okay so it's a continuation of the theme when is your chapter 10 homework due next wednesday. next wednesday i'm just pushing it back to give you the extra time to get through it when is chapter 11 homework due Never. <laughs> the wednesday after spring break the wednesday before your exam i sure hope so <laughs> I'll see you tomorrow for chapter or for lab eight, center of mass.